My name is James, and when I was eight years old, my family moved to a small town in Georgia. It was one of those places where everyone knew each other, and life moved at a slower pace. We lived in a quiet neighborhood with old houses and big shady trees. I didn't have any friends when we first arrived, but that changed when I met Oliver. Oliver lived just a few houses down the street. He was about my age, with pale skin and dark hair that hung over his eyes. He didn't talk much, and when he did, it was in a soft, almost whispering voice. But he seemed nice enough, and since there weren't many other kids around, we started playing together almost every day. At first, everything was normal. We'd ride our bikes, play with toy soldiers, and explore the neighborhood. But there was something strange about Oliver. He never smiled, not even when we were having fun. He always had this serious look on his face, like he was thinking about something far away. I tried not to think too much about it. After all, he was my only friend. One afternoon, Oliver told me he had something special to show me. He said it was a secret place, deep in the woods behind our neighborhood. I was excited, thinking we were going to discover some hidden treasure or a cool fort. So, without telling my parents, I followed him into the forest. We walked for what felt like hours, going deeper and deeper into the trees. The further we went, the darker it got. The trees were so thick that barely any sunlight came through. I started to feel uneasy, but I didn't want to seem scared, so I kept following him. Finally, we reached an old, abandoned shed. It was small, with broken windows and a door hanging off its hinges. Oliver pushed the door open, and the smell hit me first, something rotten, like dead leaves and old wood. Inside, it was dark and cold, and I could barely see anything. But then I noticed something on the floor. Scattered all around were what looked like bones. They were small, some of them broken, and I couldn't tell if they were animal bones or something else. My heart started pounding in my chest. I wanted to leave, to run back home, but I was frozen in place. That's when Oliver turned to me, and for the first time since I met him, he smiled. But it wasn't a friendly smile. It was cold, almost cruel. He looked me right in the eyes and said, This is where my last friend disappeared. I didn't wait to hear anything else. I bolted out of the shed, running as fast as I could through the trees, branches scratching my arms and face. I didn't stop until I reached home, out of breath and crying. My parents were shocked, and I told them everything. They called the police, who went out to the woods and searched the area. They found the shed, just like I described, and inside, they found the remains of a child who had been missing for years. But by the next morning, Oliver and his family were gone. No one knew where they went, and I never saw him again. The nightmares started after that. I'd wake up in a cold sweat, hearing Oliver's voice in my head, seeing his smile in the dark. Even now, all these years later, I still can't shake the fear that one day, They'll come back, smiling that same awful smile, and this time, he won't let me run away. My name is Sarah, and when I was 10 years old, I lived in a quiet neighborhood in Seattle. It was the kind of place where everyone knew each other, and we kids would play outside until the streetlights came on. Our favorite game was hide and seek, and we'd run through every yard on the block, except for one, the old Johnson house. The Johnson house was at the end of our street, and it was different from the other houses. The windows were boarded up, the paint was peeling, and the yard was overgrown with weeds. Our parents always told us to stay away from it, saying it wasn't safe. But it wasn't just the look of the house that scared us. It was the feeling you got when you got too close like someone was watching you from behind those dark windows. One afternoon, we were playing hide and seek as usual. My best friend Clara was it, and we all scattered to find the best hiding spots. I hid behind a tree in my front yard, trying to stay as quiet as possible. After a while, I realized I hadn't heard Clara call out found for anyone, so I peeked out from behind the tree. 
That's when I saw her, Clara, running towards the Johnson house. I wanted to shout out to her, to tell her to stop, but the words caught in my throat. She disappeared through the broken gate, and I just stood there, frozen. By the time I found my voice and ran after her, she was gone. I told the others what I saw, and we all searched the neighborhood, calling her name. When we couldn't find her, we told our parents, who called the police. They searched the Johnson house from top to bottom, but they didn't find Clara. They said it was just an old, empty house, and that Clara must have run off somewhere else. But I knew what I saw. Weeks went by, and there was still no sign of Clara. That's when the dream started. In my dreams, Clara was calling to me, begging me to help her. She said she was trapped in the attic of the Johnson house. I could see her face in my dreams, pale and scared, and I knew I had to do something. One night, I couldn't take it anymore. I snuck out of the house with a flashlight and made my way to the Johnson house. My heart was pounding as I pushed open the creaky front door and made my way upstairs. The house smelled old and musty, like it hadn't been touched in years. When I reached the attic, I hesitated for just a second before opening the door. Inside, it was dark and cold. My flashlight beam caught something on the floor, Clara's shoes. Next to them was an old notebook. I flipped through the pages, and they were filled with drawings of a man with hollow eyes, staring out from the shadows. I felt like I was being watched, and I ran out of there as fast as I could. The next day, my parents found me standing on the roof of our house. I don't remember how I got there, but I remember why. I could hear Clara calling me, telling me to jump. My parents were terrified, and we moved away from that neighborhood the very next week. But the dreams never stopped, and neither did the fear that something in that house was still waiting for me. My name is Peter, and when I was 10 years old, my family moved to a small town in Ohio. The house we bought was old, with creaky floors and dark corners that always seemed to be hiding something. It was the kind of house that had stories, and my parents told me one rule the day we moved in. Never go into the basement. They said it was dangerous, filled with old furniture and rotting beams. But they didn't have to say much more. The look in their eyes when they mentioned the basement was enough to keep me away at least for a while. Curiosity got the better of me, though. One night, after everyone had gone to bed, I decided to sneak downstairs. The house was quiet, except for the occasional groan of the wooden floors. I tiptoed to the basement door, my heart racing. I had to see what was so terrible down there. The basement was darker than I expected, with only a small window letting in a sliver of moonlight. I held my breath as I descended the stairs. When I reached the bottom, I was surprised to find it almost empty. Just a few old boxes and some dusty shelves. But in the far corner, there was something else, an old rusted door. I walked over to it, the hairs on the back of my neck standing up. The door creaked loudly as I opened it, revealing a small empty room. Inside, there was nothing but a single wooden chair placed right in the middle. It looked like someone had been sitting there, waiting for something. I quickly closed the door and ran back upstairs, trying to forget what I had seen. But after that night, things started to change. I began hearing voices at night, soft whispers that seemed to come from the basement. They were calling my name, telling me to come back. One night, I couldn't resist the voices anymore. I crept back down to the basement my heart pounding in my chest. When I opened the door to the small room, I was shocked to see my father sitting in the chair, his face pale and his eyes filled with tears. He looked up at me, and in a trembling voice, he confessed something that shook me to my core. Years ago, when I was just a baby, a burglar had broken into our old house. My parents had hidden in the basement with my older brother, who I had never known. In the panic, my father had accidentally killed him, mistaking him for the intruder. The guilt had haunted him ever since, and now it was too much to bear. He had been coming down to the basement every night. 
sitting in that chair, trying to face what he had done. The next morning, my father was found dead in that same chair. The doctors said it was a heart attack, but I knew better. After that day, I never set foot in the basement again. Even now, the thought of that old, rusted door still sends a chill down my spine.